Hi everyone, this is Emily with Ohio Link. We're just four o'clock, but I think I'll get started because uh, we don't need to go the full hour if we don't need to, but if we want it, we can take it. So um, I'm going to share my slides. Let's do the entire screen. It'll look goofy for a minute, but we will switch over. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so this is the Ohio Link ETD Center Users Group Meeting. But given that accessibility has been such a hot topic, we might have others interested in well, as well, and this will be recorded. So anyone, um, even from Ohio, who's watching the ProQuest Users Group live, they can come back later and, and watch this one virtually. Here we go. So the agenda today is to give a very brief Ohio Link ETD Center update. I always love showing numbers and um, talking about the, the overview. Then we'll go through uh, the digital accessibility release that's coming up and I will show screenshots and do a feature overview of what's to come. Then we'll also talk about resources for putting ETD digital accessibility into local practice. And this is really, we have this release coming, but how do you make it work? That's the part we'll talk about. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. And again, we can take questions from anyone, whether you're an Ohio Link member or not, I'll field whatever comes up. All right, Ohio Link ETD Center update. This is one of my favorite things to show off, our cool pie chart. We're now at over 100,000 EPs. And uh, the biggest um, piece of that pie chart is the Ohio State University. They added uh, retrospective PhDs a few years ago, which bumps their numbers up even more. So they have a bit bigger piece of the pie. But we have 36, uh, 36 contributing institutions. We're currently over. I know. It's it's not the Michigan blue, though. It's a paler. But I will have to ask the developers if we can hard code OSU Scarlet in there for you. <laughs> that is a fair point. I don't know why the system picks blue is the biggest, but we'll, we'll work in that. Uh, we have um, over 100,000 now. And um, even though it's not last summer, last summer we celebrated 20 years. So the ETD Center now has been around 21 years. It always amazes me. Uh, we have nearly 120 million downloads to date and 12 million plus from last fiscal year alone. A lot of this has to do with um, being incorporated to Google Scholar, but part of it is just being online and being really findable. And our documents are uh, open access. and Nearly all of them are full text submissions, and uh, very few actually have embargoes, or the embargoes will fall off. And so really everything is available. Um, and these numbers will probably grow a bit more too. We also have um, full text searching of the OCR PDF documents that was added last uh, summer as well. So we'll see if that also helps bring more interest into the ETD Center and making more things findable, searchable, and get used even more. But that's always exciting download numbers to see. And in Google Scholar, it links back to our permalink in the ETD Center. So even if they find it there, if they go look at the page or to download the file, that's coming into these statistics and, and we capture that. So that's still through our, our platform. <laughs> the digital... So we had a question in the room of, do we know how those numbers compare to other repositories that have ETDs? Um, not offhand, that's not something that I've looked at. Uh, yeah, I can, um, we can certainly look at the downloads by our institutions, but if you're thinking about other repositories, um, yeah, that's kind of... I think it depends. Yeah, 
Yeah, the, the individual IRs that institutions set up usually have really good statistics and tracking. Um, and then for anyone who uses ProQuest, you can compare with other institutions or, or levels. Um, but that's because they're within their system. So it's still system by system, but that's a, that's a fair point. And, um, you know, that could potentially be a, a research interest, right? I'm sure um, people post these download numbers maybe, or if you did a survey, you could ask people for it. But yeah, I'm not sure where it stacks up. To me, it always sounds like a lot. <laughs> So in January 2023, we have the Digital Accessibility ETD 3.2 release coming, and that's mostly what we're going to talk about today. So we'll go on to the Digital Accessibility release and feature overview. So the Digital Accessibility release 3.2, um, we're scheduling the update for January 2023. I don't have a firm date yet, but that will be coming for every, um, for the Ohio Link members in the room. We will set a date and it'll go out to the listserv. This will be affecting ETD admin, which is our back end site where the submissions actually happen, and what we call ETD search, which is the public ETD center that most people think about when you want to go see a published one or what other institutions might know as the ETD center. That's the the public facing ETD search as we call it. Right now we're just starting the phase of user testing. I sent out an email to the Ohio Link ETD listserv a couple weeks ago asking for interest at a lot of pingbacks, which is excellent. So once we're back from the conference, I'll be next week hopefully sending out information of where to go, how to log in, making sure everyone has accounts who wants to test it, because this is the exciting part and the place where we can do some feedback from all of our admins, any staff that you want in there to help test and make any final tweaks or adjustments or catch any bugs if we can before the January release. So that is why the, the user testing is um, exciting and very important. So now I'll go through the features of it and the things that are changing. Uh, for ETD admin, the submission side of things, for digital accessibility, we'll have and I will show screenshots after this. Uh, there's agreement page wording that's going to be new for the student level um, or the submission form that the students will see. There's an option to upload a digital accessibility report. Again, option. This is not mandatory at this time. So if you want to put one in or your students are asked to put one in based on your requirements, that'll be possible. Uh, the review page has been updated to show any uh, digital accessibility report file that's uploaded um, as well. The final step of publishing will uh, include an acknowledgement that all local minimal digital accessibility standards, so MDAS, are met in the uploaded ETD PDF. So that's the part on the reviewer side as you go to publish. We'll have one more pop-up that'll um, need to be um, acknowledged for publishing. And then the system itself will indicate if there's a report or not attached. So that is not going to be selectable, but the system will know to do it um, if one's there as part of the submission. We've also updated the preview page for ETD which is available to students to see before they fully submit their document or as reviewers to kind of give a double check and also to show. So I'm glad we we're able to update the preview as well. That was a new feature last summer that I was really excited about. I hope other people use it and enjoy it too. I just thought it was a great way to give everyone an advanced look at what the metadata is going to be like if they put in their embargo request or not and that kind of stuff. Um, we also have a column option added to the status reports, so you can easily go into the different categories of statuses and select to see the report file, and it'll say yes or no if a digital accessibility report is uploaded. So we're going to start tracking that as well to help people, especially any schools that want to require it, to easily look to see if their submitted ETDs have one or not. So I think that'll be important tracking in the future. 
So I'm going to walk through the slides. I did highlight the text that is being added or the things that are changing. Um, so it's highlighted for the presentation benefit. This won't be highlighted in the system itself. No, this is unfortunately just my screenshot that I have. Is it uh, pretty small on screens? Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it out loud. And my uh, slides will be available for later download. I like to take bigger shots to show more of the screen, but you're right, I probably should have done a zoomed in one for the phrasing. Um, so the highlighted part says, you acknowledge and agree that you have used best efforts to comply with your institution's acceptable accessibility standards for ETDs. And that is just one of a list of things that says do not continue unless, and that's gonna be the new one that's added as students go through. So we're not changing the publication agreement, which is just below it. This is just part of the make sure you've done this to the students. And again, the your institution will apply to each member institution that's using it. So the Ohio State Universities is gonna be different from University of Toledo, is gonna be different from OU. And so we use that phrase, your institution, so you can all customize it. This is the document upload page. <clears throat> We've added a new file type. So that's that first highlight on the screen. It says document type, and then a drop down for choosing either thesis, dissertation, supplemental file, or the highlighted one is now the new digital accessibility report. So it is gonna be called out specifically as a type on its own, instead of just uploading it as a supplemental file and worrying about naming it or finding it later. So the question was, do we anticipate students using and uploading reports? I don't know. The, we are allowing it at the student, the document upload level, which students or um, staff can do. <coughs> so that it's possible no matter what you decide you want requirements to be. If you want students to generate these and upload them, it's possible. If you want the staff to do it, if you don't want to do it, but it's there and it's tracked separately. <laughs> um, so we tried to make it easy and thinking about how it's going to display in the system and also just keeping track of these things if they're ever needed in the future, if you need to see what has something or doesn't. So as you can see in the bottom half, we, we have the uploaded documents. We have the thesis document. We have a supplemental file, which is a JPEG. And then we have the document type accessibility report, which is the second highlighting lower down on the page. A lot of talking today, excuse me. So the, the thing to note here in this example, I uploaded an HTML version of a report. <clears throat> it came up um, in other presentations about what software to use and if you don't have access to proprietary software, what else can you use? There are other things that will generate accessibility reports or um, we wanted it to be flexible to be able to capture the wide variety of possible formats and to make it acceptable to what your local workflows might cover or what you're able to do. So we don't just require an Adobe report type that might be a PDF. We've allowed, say, this HTML page in case you can generate a report that way or any other type of file that you need that you're able to use if you want to do reports. Again, this is optional, but we've put in the ability and we've made it any file type just to be broad and customizable since there isn't one standard way of doing everything, at least not yet. <clears throat> this is that review page that I talked about. It shows um, an overview of the metadata that was entered, the publication choices that were made, about copyright and all that. Um, the mailing address is the Ohio Link office. And so it shows that student information, if it was for an actual student, 
and then the files down below, including the digital accessibility report. So that comes through to the review page as well. For publishing though, now we're away from the, um, the student view and we're thinking about the reviewer or the local ETD admin, if they're the ones that publish, <clears throat> when you click <clears throat> either ready to publish ETD, which is now a queue feature in the new release last summer, and it'll hold it ready to publish and you know you've reviewed it already, or if you click publish ETD and it immediately publishes, you will see this either way because what you're doing right now is saying it's ready to go. I don't need to look at this document again. So this is where we need to capture this, regardless of if you're going to publish right away or um, release them all later. <clears throat> As we can see, the uh, second option is checked, and it, that's the digital accessibility report it is attached to the um, submission. So the system checked that for me already, because this example has one. But it's this top checkbox. Uh, I won't read the entire agreement, um, but we can go over that if, if we want, I suppose, if that would be helpful. So we do, <clears throat> I will read the top checkbox. So we have the agreement that says you did everything to the best of your ability and to local MDAS. And then it says to publish this submission, please confirm that you have completed the following steps. And the first checkbox under that is the MDAS or applicable accessibility standards have been satisfied to the fullest extent possible. And then it says required. So because that is not selected, I can't click OK and publish the CTD. So on the now selected that option, the system knows there's a report already. So it's auto selected that one. And now I can click OK and publish the ETD. This is the same thing, except this example didn't have a report, so that second one isn't auto-checked. I'm still not able to click OK. On the next one, I've clicked the first one to say I've done the accessibility to the fullest extent possible, and now the OK box is available. So the report is optional, and whether you have one or not, you're still able to publish but your reviewers or you will need to click I have satisfied to the fullest extent possible. And that'll be starting in January for all new ETDs being published. <laughs> Would it, yes, please. I think if it, if it works, I can just re-ask a question. So unless you have like, if you have significant comments, we can have you come up, and maybe that's easier than trying to turn on yet another mic and ruin the technology in the room, potentially. Sure. So do you want to come up? And I can I can share this one over here, Tim, if you want to come join me up oh, top. Okay. How about that? <laughs> Pull it over here for a minute. All right, so my question is on the, so basically what we have is, thank you. So basically what we have is, um, so our students for this autumn are going to be submitting their documents in a couple months, basically. And I don't think they're gonna be, it's not gonna be ready, we're not ready. And so kind of for us playing forward, if the document was uploaded, you know, before you guys go live with the new system, when we go to publish, I assume they'll still they'll be in the new system at that point, we'd have to check that box. That makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So anything that hasn't been published, even if it's submitted before January, we'll still see that box in January. Okay. That's You're right. right. So it's whenever the whenever it's actually published. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So how do we probably reconcile that? You know, starting to submit any time from now till the end of fall semester. In my case, in our case, not me meeting those accessibility standards, but when I go to publish them six to eight weeks or six weeks after um, their degrees have been conferred, 
but I will say that we met the accessibility standards. So uh, the question was, so if you have a lot of those from fall that don't actually get published until after in the January part, are they still going to be held to the accessibility standards? Um, yes, they will still see this message. Now, I mean, if it's helpful, um, and maybe someone in, if someone's asking in chat, is it worth reading? Because maybe I should read the agreement. Because we built in, well, we have to the fullest extent possible. So, um, but it, it's also your local standards. So as we get further into the presentation, we'll talk about customizing it for local use. Um, <clears throat> Because we, we refer to it as um, the local standards, your, your institution's minimal accessibility digital, digital accessibility standards, MDAS, or if there's no established institutional MDAS, the most recent industry standard. So we built some wording in there, but really you're going to need to write, you're going to want to write something. And we can talk about what that becomes. Um, later on, but they will see it. And, um, you know, it's right now it's to the best of everyone's ability and getting started. We know there's going to be that, you know, that time where everyone's ramping up or doing what they can and maybe building to stuff later. Um, it will see the, the, uh, checkbox if you, you publish later, but, um, you know, that's going to be, um, Officially, it'll it'll be there, but if if um, those ones aren't under what you're putting out for the accessibility standards, uh, they might not have gone through that yet. So yeah, I understand. There's going to be like that weird overlap. Um, and for those ones, you if you didn't have a standard in place yet, I mean, you're doing what you're working to it, and so you'll still need to check it. But, you know, to the fullest extent possible, if you didn't have it in place yet, it, it wasn't possible yet. You know, I mean, it's kind of tricky. But I think for that starting off, there might be that circumstance. But, you know, we'll, we'll just have to work through that for, for the time, if that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's the, so the, the question is, when should you do it, especially if your fall students are really going to be published in January, because that's their, really when it's going to go, but they're working on them now, say. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think the startup is going to be a tricky time to capture. I mean, whatever you can do as soon as it makes sense, I think is always good. If you can start sooner and you can do stuff, um, I don't know if you caught the Kent uh, session before, but if you uh, listen to them and how they're putting in um, digital accessibility standards, they're trying to start with something simple that they know they're already meeting. You know, if a lot of students are doing clickable um, table of contents, that kind of already plays with headings in some ways, and it's an easier discussion with students about making sure headings are set up properly because they're already kind of making use and seeing the the um, the effect of having that in there. Um, and that's, um, as we'll get into the, to the uh, setting your, your local MDAS, that's the, the important thing of us keeping it customizable so you can start where you need to start. And then if you want to add more and build up to it, but that's a fair point. And, um, you know, at some point, uh, we have to pick a date, unfortunately, and it's not going to be, it's never going to be perfect and to get everyone up and running. And uh, even though there are some accessibility um, 
uh, there's some legislation about accessibility and certain requirements. As far as the detailed submissions of PDFs, you know, that's still really, um, there's nothing necessarily formalized that we can have everyone follow. So we're trying to figure that out as we go. And of course, as institutions, you're trying to figure out what you can fit in as you go too. So, you know, that's, it's, as long as we're showing that we're working towards stuff and doing that good faith effort, you have a plan for the future ones and, and that's coming. I think if there is some overlap, um, that's certainly gonna be a time period that we'll probably keep in mind as you know policies went into place, but this first batch, some of these might not have hit the requirements because they came sooner. So yeah, we're gonna have to start requiring it in January, but maybe at that point, you know, if you didn't have something officially in place that you were working with students, they're obviously not going to catch it, but that's going to just be due to a timing issue of coordinating these things. And that's the hard part, trying to, to pick a date, but then setting it far out enough and telling people you got to start working on it. But there's also not a checklist we can give people. And that's the, the hard part of digital accessibility, yeah, the challenge. You know, yeah. Yes, Kent's just starting now too. So the, the discussion in the room, the discussion in the room is about uh, concerns for especially that first batch of students that are going to hit up against the reviewers have to check this box um, and maybe things aren't in place because they're doing their stuff right now. So it's hard to catch them in media res in time for, for the January when this checkbox is going to be there. Um, a lot of, um, especially with PDF, certain things tend to come with it sometimes. And so they might be accessible to a certain extent. Uh, Kent found that, you know, a lot of their figure descriptions worked in ways that were really similar to alt text. And so if you have people that are putting in super descriptive figure descriptions, figure text, I mean, that might serve in a similar function, you know. And so um, whether you do alt text right away or these submissions come in with that, you know, that might um, be part of it, at least to start. I mean, they're not... Um, it's, it's also a, a gradient of, of just how accessible and in what ways, right? So it's not a yes, no, is it accessible or not? It's in what ways is it accessible and to who and to how much, like to what extent? Um, so it's also tricky to sometimes talk about digital accessibility and then think about where it lives everywhere. <laughs> No, it's it's not a point to alternate text. You're right, but right, it wouldn't serve as alt alt text. But if it's descriptive in its own way, then um, I guess well, I 
you can watch the, the Kent one. They make better arguments than I do. But they're starting off with what they're able to do and what they've been finding in, in ETDs already. Um, that's the thing. Everyone needs to do something of their own. Uh, so I'm going to walk through the screenshots, and then we're kind of talking about the resources stuff and building local policy just kind of naturally, like how to put it into place. So I'm going to um, progress through this, and then we can get to that point, and I can pull up some websites and resources, and we can look at that a bit. Uh, this is the preview page before something gets published that a, a student can look at or the reviewer or admin can look at. It's watermarked, but this is what it would look like if it were published at the moment. The digital accessibility report is going to be part of the files get shown. So that's what we've set up right now. And then it shows them what other information is, is going to look like just as a, a preview of the published ETD to come. If there's an embargo, all the files get the same thing, including the digital accessibility report. So this just kind of shows you um, none of that will be available until the embargo falls off, if you have any of those. For the <clears throat> status reports, we now have this column that you can add, and it'll say yes or no if it has a report. And then you'd, you could go into it to get the actual file, or you could view it on the public site and see the file there if you needed the report in the future. And then just for ETD search, this one's pretty simple. It's just the display of the report. I showed you the preview, but this is a live published ETD in our test system. This one has an example file again, so the report is there. And this one's embargoed, so again, it's not showing up because the file, all of the files that were uploaded are embargoed. So we've gotten into this discussion again because it just naturally happens. But we'll talk about resources for putting ETD digital accessibility into local practice. This came up in the Kent one as well. Uh, the Ohio Link recommended minimum requirements. This is meant to be a potential starting point for writing your own institution's local ETD digital accessibility policy and requirements. Uh, I've also had feedback that policy can be a, a more official term on some campuses. So if it's the MDAS that you need to um, call it, we can also, that's what we refer to as the institution's MDAS. So um, that can also be another option. I think it would be helpful if I show this. So this should still be showing up in drop, uh, hop in. Um, no, we weren't going to post on Ohio Link, but I can share it to the listserv if that would be helpful. <laughs> All right. For Ohio Link members, the slides will go out to the ETD listserv after the conference. And then for other conference attendees, you can get it through Hopin and then um, when they make the, the conference proceedings available, I have submitted my slides as well, so you can get it too. <clears throat> so we have a page and we give the purpose, the recommended practice, and we strongly urge every member institution to adapt local MDAS for your institution. And that's what we refer to in that checkbox, so whatever it ends up being, and maybe uh, you need a, a one for when it goes live in January then. Maybe you say for anything submitted but published in January, this is the local MDAS that we're going to hold it to, and maybe there's not too much there. And then maybe you have another statement that says for everything else that's submitted after this date, this is what you're going to be held to as the MDAS. So maybe it's that iterative to catch it. <clears throat> Again, it's your local MDAS, and that's why I highly recommend writing one because that's what we're going to refer to, and then, then you can make it your own. <laughs> but because we needed to start somewhere and give people a potential checklist or things to think about <clears throat> where you begin lo locally, uh, we do have this recommended minimum for PDFs, which the PDF includes full text, and that's already, you know, everything's 
submit it as a PDF and everything has a text. Like that is the point of your PDF documents, right? Is to be the text. So you already need that. Um, <clears throat> we also recommended that the PDF accessibility permission tag is checked, which is an option you can set when you're creating your PDF. Um, <clears throat> the text language in the PDF is specified. So if it's written in English, you check to make sure that it says English language in the um, PDF settings. Uh, we do recommend that figures and images include alt text because that is, as uh, Kim was discussing with us in the room, it is very important. Figure descriptions alone aren't a good start or a good replacement, but um, we do recommend alt text be in there, especially for figures and images. And then that the PDF includes a title. So um, that first header level is usually the title level. So those are recommended. They're not, uh, they are bare. They're a bare minimum <clears throat> because it's somewhere to start. You can go beyond this. You really should tailor it to whatever you find important. We don't talk about color contrast or some of the other things you could go into that you might want to. Um, <clears throat> Some institutions have gone way beyond this. Some institutions are starting with a couple things. So please write, if you're an Ohio Link member, please write your own local MDAS to use. That meets what you need, because uh, that's part of it. Everyone's local workflow is different. <clears throat> and their staffing levels are different. And so most of our policies in the Ohio Link ETD Center are up to you all. We're the submission platform, we take the document, but you control the policies, you control the publishing of the submission itself, <clears throat> saying if it's ready or not, if it needs more work, if it needs more formatting, that's all up to you. So we've set this up the same way. Everyone has a different embargo policy. Some allow it, some require a form, some don't allow it, some require it for a certain amount of time before it gets released, and this is going to work in the same way. So you're going to want a local MDAS of some sort, and you could always revise and add to it as, um, as able later if you want. <clears throat> so the resource list is another page that we have. This has information, but it also links out to useful tutorials, websites. With digital accessibility, some other institutions and departments already do some great things and have some great student resources. So we don't want anyone to recreate if you don't need to. If you need to make your own, that's fine. But, um, you know, we want to make sure we can aggregate certain things that people can use. What's already there? So, uh, again, we have a purpose. And this page is intended for admins and reviewers. So we're not trying to help you train the students on this page. It's to help you check these things. So for our minimum, <laughs> You know, we have uh, resources about digital accessibility Again, Montana State, University of Alabama, Penn State, University of Toronto, Mississippi State University, and Michigan State University all had great websites or information available. Um, this one's a YouTube channel that already discusses digital accessibility in various ways and for different topics. So we've linked to all of those. We have resources for creating accessibility accessible ETD uh, files, so things about Word, things for Google Docs, Grackle Docs, tools for checking uh, PDF accessibility. This came up at the, the Kent presentation too of what do you use if you can't have or afford Adobe uh, Acrobat. There's another checker, a Tington checker, if I'm saying that right, the PAC or PAC 2021 is a free tool as well. Um, there's also some uh, websites to help check for accessibility too. And then this goes into um, the detail looking at the um, Adobe Acrobat Pro and how to check all the Ohio Link minimums. So that list that we had of four or five items um, that you can customize for your own local MDAS, but for those ones that we list, here's a start on how to look at it and do it. So that's been all linked as well. So this is hopefully a resource to get everyone started in how to check some of these and then send you out to other places where they've already done 
above and beyond just these, but also other things to look at. And they link out or provide resources to um, work with the students on how they can do it. So the last, uh, well, we have a couple more points. The last website that I'll jump out to, though, is the Decisions and Considerations Guide. This is really points to think through when planning local implementation of ETD digital accessibility policy and workflows. I put this together for our members, but I suppose anyone could really pick it up and look at it. Uh, so I will take you to it. It was my aim to think through the various pathways someone might think about this stuff. Um, so it's a little here. And um, I only briefly changes and all that stuff. And I'll jump down to like workflows. So for the submissions, so one question I have. Do students submit their own ETDs, or are they submitted on behalf of the student by a local administrator or reviewer? We have two, way, two ways that ETDs get into the center, and it might not be the students, so you might just be training your staff for when they upload the document doing these things. Um, in the review process, what happens if you require some of these things and they're not done? Do you send it back to the student? Or are you a campus that edits the ETDs yourself? And so you would just make that change yourself and re-upload the document. Um, do you have local existing instructions for you or your staff or your submitters um, that might be updated to create any local documentation? Um, so just kind of broader questions from different topics just to get people thinking. I won't go through everything. But that's what this document is. It's, it's, it's try to begin to cover things that you might want to think through based on your circumstances and what apply. Because again, that local MDAS is going to be important, but it's also making sure it's doable and you can put it into action and where that responsibility lives with the student, with the staff, um, and how you're going to work that. So again, we're trying to make it customizable like our other policies to fit into your workflows because you know that best. And staffing is different at every uh, member institution for the ETD Center. We also have community meetings. <clears throat> so we have an upcoming Q&A session on October 3rd. We might have a little mini presentation as part of that, but we're going to leave a lot of time for Q&A so we can have an open discussion and talk some more about these questions because this has been great from the room too and hopefully we'll have some online um, questions if they come in too that we can address. But that session is also coming up because I know everyone's not here at US ETDA and so, and we can't say this enough to people, right? It's, it's something that we can continue talking about and it's beneficial whether people are here or not today. So that's another opportunity um, to discuss um, ETD accessibility with uh, OhioLink coming soon. And that will, it's been going out on the listserv. We'll also send it again as a reminder, getting closer. Also on the OhioLink website, we have recordings available in our webinars section. Everything's transcribed, they're posted. So if you want to catch a previous ETD community meeting, we've been discussing this for at least a couple years. So I think the March 21 meeting as well as March 22 uh, capture that, um, capture di digital, they both talk about digital accessibility um, as their main topics. And I think those are just the two main ones that are up there. But all of our ETD community meetings are, are posted and available. The third one will also be recorded and be posted about a week or two later as well to be uh, reviewed later too, if people need. So now I'm gonna open it up for any more Q&A. Yes. If our, if our MDAS was three things for the accessibility report, of course it's going to list other things that aren't going to be addressed. Does that kind of raise any red flags for 
know, the leader or any other entities? Like, how do we, uh, so, how do we you know, reconcile that? So the question in the room was, so if you upload a digital accessibility report, it's going to show certain things that it ran in the report, but if your local MDAS has only a few of those as required, how do we reconcile the two? Because the, the digital accessibility report, if it's attached, it will be up and a view, uh, available to the public, a viewable file. That is also why we made it any file format. So if you want to customize something, you can use any report report that you want. And so maybe that looks like a text document or something, or generate your own PDF that says this has these requirements were met. And if it's a if it's a I'm just I'm just brainstorming this new as I am talking. Um, but you could maybe do a template, right? If you need all the ETDs to match your local MDAS and it's three, four things, if it's four things, you could have a template that says this ETD matches these minimal digital accessibility standards. It has been checked and verified. And maybe you just save that. And if that's going to be, if you want the report attached, you could generate that in any format you want. Um, and then you could post that up with every ETD. And it almost becomes like a, type of cover sheet then, right? Like a report that you just stick, it's, it's, we verified that it has to meet all these because that's our local MDAS and that's what we require. We made sure it did. And now we also want a report to say that it does. We're gonna put that in, upload it, and then you have that. And if it's the same for each and every one and they have to meet it, you could potentially do something like that where you always just attach that same file or maybe it has the title and the author name on it too, right? Or something to um, identify it as as distinct. These four standards on each. But then you're not, no. Well, it depends. So it's an optional step. They have things that even, since we've been doing it for so long, right? Still have some issues that we yeah, so the, the point was made about if it's a LaTeX file, you might not be able to meet. And maybe you have a different document that you upload for that, or maybe you don't upload a report for that. I, I mean, maybe, or maybe you have one that says this document is in LaTeX. To the best of our ability, we tried to meet these standards, but at this time, LaTeX does not allow for that. And then they do. Yeah, that. So, so, just making the accessible report in Acrobat, how bad they deal now? So we've left the report optional. The question is if you generate the report in Adobe Acrobat, but for like a LaTeX file, you need to like stipulate some things. If that's what you want to do, then you'd have to do that separate and then upload it. Um, it's an optional. It's an optional file right now. We left it customizable to file format too, because we don't know what to expect. We don't know if we're going to need to attach these things if we want them, or what format, or what style. Adobe does some good reports that it'll auto-generate, but you're right. There's certain things that don't get covered, or that might not be um, applicable to that ETD that can't be possible. Um, that might look odd in a report that says it failed this, but, you know, there's context needed. So um, we're not requiring the report, but we're making it possible in case that's of value and it, it's uh, something that wants to be added. Um, it seemed like an interesting thing to put in, and because it's coming with the standard, we thought if we're going to do something like that, it makes sense to make it as part of this release and make it available. But yeah, it's the as people begin to work through this, I think that's also going to affect um, the use of the system. And again, if there's an official PDF standard that comes out or best practices or something, maybe that also affects what you generate for a report or the standards people follow. But right now, everyone seems to be working towards this, and it's good. We're doing what we can in ways that we can um, before there's anything any mandates or anything more official in place exactly relevant to this these documents so it's 
we're still in that uh, it, digital accessibility uh, is is pretty nebulous in that in that way, and so we talk about it as a topic, but there's a lot of components to it, and you know, fully accessible is is hard to achieve. I think even if you meet all the accessibility report requirements, because there's always another way it could probably be more accessible, right? And there might be ways we think about in the future too. So it's also kind of a snapshot at this time to what we're setting up at the moment, but that might change down the road and then we might have to look at things differently or account for something else. So we're also trying to build that flexibility into the system um, while making it customizable for you all. But these are really great points. Yeah, it's a it's a challenge to try to put something into place that is so new, but it seems of value and everyone wants to talk about it and want to do things for it. Because, you know, making things accessible benefits everyone, even if it's for certain populations who might, it, it might be really crucial for. So that's also an interesting idea too. Hey, um, mm -hmm. Where's the authority that comes from? Here's the thoughts on where the authority that comes from. We're not getting that. You know, either assuming that's the authority that comes from or anything. Right? They would be the ones establishing that. But does the graduate school have the ability to also say, this is our MBA or BC's? I think we, we need a one specifically for BC's education. So, so can we do that? I think, or is that I mean, so I, I'm, I'm going to say it depends to answer you now, and I'm going to repeat what I can for the, the chat um, or for the online participants. So the question um, was, who has the authority to create the local MDAS, um, and where does that live, and does the grad school have, have a say in the matter, or could they? Um, I'm going to say it depends on the campus, unfortunately, as with all policies or if a local MDAS could be um, not necessarily treated as an official policy, but you could do it in a different way. I mean, that that's going to be up to what is possible on your campus and how things work and what the culture is and how things are set up. Um, if anyone was at the Kent session, um, there was a great question asked about, you know, Ohio Link follows WCAG AA 2.0, you're following that for ETDs, that's so um, incredible, how are you doing that? And the, the, the distinction is um, OhioLink will follow that for certain purchases for new content, because that's what OSU is doing. So there are fiscal agent, I didn't I realize I launched into this, assuming you know what OhioLink is, everyone. And we're, a, so I'll step back a second. We're an academic library consortium we have about 100 members for, um, from institutions throughout the state. So two years, independent uh, universities, public institutions, um, community colleges. We have uh, Cleveland Clinic is, is a member and the State Library of Ohio. So um, we're a central office that helps all those members. Of those about 100 members, we have 36 that submit to the ETD center. And so all of their ETDs are together in kind of a consortial repository that's open access, built by our own developers. So it's a homegrown system, uh, which means I can work with developers to get this stuff in and to make tweaks and we can do user testing that, that um, matters to the system because I'm working with the developers on our system. Um, so, so as uh, OSU is our fiscal agent, and for new purchases, they need things to require the WCAG 2.0 guidelines. And for everything else, they're um, moderating things. So for uh, our library director, deans and directors group, decided that accessibility is something that Ohio Link needs to focus on. It's a priority for them. And part of that was they called out um, ETDs in specific to make sure that content, because as a content provider, our institutions are submitting to the ETD Center and we're providing that as Ohio Link. So they want the content to be accessible because we have influence and control over what, what goes in there. So that's why these requirements came about. For the local MDAS, that'll just kind of depend on your institution and what you're able to pull off and who needs to be involved. I mean, certainly, the people publishing and the local admins should have a role somewhere in that. And um, 
just where else it needs to go will kind of depend on local circumstances, um, just because everyone's kind of different. But it, it would make sense that it would probably either come from or start with something from the, the people who are um, approving the, the ETDs, so the local administrators, and then whatever staff is also involved, because it's going to be you all putting it in your workflows and also training your, your students that are submitting however they get trained and anyone else affected. So it is going to be a bit of a ripple um, to make sure people are, are meeting what you decide. So I know it's not the best answer because, of course, people like specific things, but that's unfortunately, I think, kind of the, it just is going to depend. Does that kind of get after? Yeah, so if you have a local ADA person or if there's a council that you need to pass things by, that'll just kind of depend. Um, mm -hmm. So we have students submit by what we call end of semester. Mm -hmm. They actually have to January 6th to do some documents. So they have to finish at that point. They graduate in spring. Um, of course, we'll be publishing their documents in spring as well. Um, but they would not be finishing until January 6th. So uh, it, it, it might be effective day, Danny. <laughs> Um, it would be nice to do the transition after that. I don't know if anybody else has some deadlines that might. Yes, yeah. So there's a. It could go after that date. So the students are. Yeah, there's a comment in the room about how there's certain January dates potentially for for students and end of the term and, and when people graduate exactly. Um, we can certainly talk about an exact date in January when this would go live and when you start seeing that acknowledgement and pop up come. Um, again, we haven't settled on a date yet. So, I mean, we can certainly, maybe it's time to do another survey out to the listserv to ask about deadlines, but also maybe do you have anything in January that um, would be good to work around if we can easily avoid some of this. Um, for those, at least that starting submission. So, um, yeah, I, it sounds like I should probably get a list uh, so survey out. Maybe having two that the ADA are getting a lot of cover of documents from all or boards and the semester period that says this is what we're following, whatever that is, or these being board accessibility standards or whatever. I'm just thinking, you know, I know that you know, Ohio State has one. Mm -hmm. you know, I kind of mentioned you, just, you know, separately about uh, our AD coordinator. It's supposed to be reaching out to you to, to talk about what Ohio State's and the AS really is, what he thinks that it needs. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was wondering, you know, should we have something more local? But who is that? I think the thesis of dissertation specific and the AS, I think, not just what the university has for. Yeah, so when we talk about the ETD MDAS, we do refer to it as as such because I think it is different and unique content. Um, so I, I think it's probably valuable to have a, a specific ETD one, no matter what your, um, if you even have a, a local MDAS already, but maybe there needs to be an ETD version. Uh, that's probably going to be ben beneficial because these are very specific things. And so having a specific one might make sense. Um, there was also interest in, in um, my idea of having the, um, the two MDASs that maybe you have them dated. So things before this date apply this thing, and this one applies for things going forward. Um, I, I think that's an interesting idea that people could think about too, especially if you're going to have this kind of in-between gap of we're going to start having this stuff go up and you're going to see it, but those students weren't um, incorporated into whatever the requirements are. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, <laughs> just looking for any other questions. Um, room chatter is fine. I just don't want to miss a question. So do we have any other questions in the room? Granted, like I said, I was assessing the ability of the students to be able to 
more than what they're requiring, but I made the video this summer for us. It's not about PGS. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, what did they ask you about? <laughs> okay, so so accessibility is very hands off. So um, they're like, you know, WCG standards basically that's it, and that really applies more to websites than And funnily enough, I just, we just got an email today that I'm going to start working on. I was like, this is crazy that this BGSG equal access email. Talking about being a public university, all is good. Okay. And um, it says it's talking about making our content accessible, ensures all people have the same opportunities to benefit from educational information about resources and services. And well, it says it's also the law in BGSU policy. But it is the law. And then it, it starts talking about some best practices. It has a link for web accessibility, and then it goes down to the technical guidelines so that I can go ahead and look at so Kim, I'm going to give a brief recap and then I looked at my watch and we are at 5 o'clock. We have uh, filled the hour. Um, Kim did a recording from uh, BGSU, but it sounds like it's not branded. No. So it's not branded and she will share it to the ETD listserv. Sure. Could you do that? Send it out and then um, Ohio Link members can have it. And so you can have um, Kim's walkthrough of the MDAS that she uh, set up and how to meet those standards for the student for those students and so you could see an example or, or think about using something similar um, this has been a really great session did we have any online questions or nothing was coming in okay you can always email me I'm eflynn at ohiolink.edu uh, we also have a Twitter and we also have a Twitter for our ETDs. I probably should put that up there because all of our ETDs get tweeted out. But you can contact us at Ohio Link if you need or if you want to chat more, I'd love to talk. And if you're an Ohio Link member, come to the October 3rd Q&A that we have going on to talk more about digital accessibility. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.